Hey guys, Jennifer here, Vice President of Growth and Marketing for Sonoran Desert Institute. I wanted to hop in before we get rolling into the actual webinar because uh, I have a little bit of a mea culpa to do. Um, I, last night when we did the webinar with Kip, I forgot to press record until about 15 minutes in. Very, very sorry, totally on me. Um, usually pretty good at that, but must have been off my game last night. And so what you're gonna see is a jump cut directly into the middle of a sentence. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context on what was going on last night. First of all, you're in for a treat. If you weren't there live, um, Kip is about to dispel a ton of information to you. Um, he is truly a font of information. So very excited for you to see that. There were a couple things that he started with that I wanted to just kind of let you guys know about before you leap into the middle of this conversation. Um, Kip started with kind of the notion of the business ethics part of restorations and that in a nutshell is guys only do things that you know you're going to do a good job at you know if somebody comes to you with something that you feel uncomfortable with it's always a smart business move as kip says to make sure that you're not doing a bad job at things you know uh he is a big big um you know believer in word of mouth marketing uh and is acutely aware of what good and bad word of mouth marketing can do for a business so he spent a little bit of time talking about that making good decisions doing right by your customers and then there were a couple items that he references later in the webinar as well um, as tools and resources that i wanted to make you aware of first of those is and he spends a little bit of time on this talking about the blue book of gun values um, highly recommends picking up a copy especially if you're going to be getting into restorations you can get them online um, he, I think he says, even, you may even see this later in the, in the recording, but, uh, pick it up every couple years kind of thing. Not something you need to bring it, you know, get the 41st edition, then the 42nd edition, and then the 43rd, you know, 43rd. So, uh, every couple years, pick up that book. He says it's super, super useful. Um, next thing he talks about is the endo snake, endo snake. Um, and, uh, and he talks about that a little bit more in the webinar, but for those of you who had asked about it in the chat that night, endo snake is the name of the product um to kind of help check things out in the barrel prior to doing any restorations um he also talks about using a magnifying visor or a magnification headset or an optivisor something along those lines to help um kind of for more of those minute pieces uh and then recommends dowels and wood blocks as well as very common items that you'll be using in restorations talks about steel wool a little bit but you'll see some of that in uh in the recording as well so I wanted to catch everybody up to speed on a couple of those items. We only missed, you know, the first 10 minutes of it. So you should still have 45 really good minutes of content uh, coming at you. We're excited to see, uh, to, to share that out with you guys. And we really, really hope you enjoy it. So sit, sit back uh, and give it a watch. And welcome to Restoration Station featuring SDI's master gunsmith, Kip Carpenter. Thanks, guys. Real numbers and hidden little uh insignias it clarifies it for you this model has like two little lights on the side but they're great also when you're working with the wood to make sure you get on your dents and things like that out mm -hmm. so that that is a must basic tools sanding blocks and that's the other thing i want to talk about too is like sanding blocks for instance mm -hmm. uh, on, when you're working with wood you don't need a lot of expensive tools you really don't to redo a stock and some of the things I use, I make the majority of the tools myself. Wooden dowels of all sizes are great for wrapping sandpaper around and getting into your grooves and areas around your pistol grip. Mm -hmm. For those that are cut in for Monte Carlos, they're great for getting in there, okay, and, and brushing all that up. And also, you're gonna want to make some little wood blocks of different sizes. I make them from a quarter inch wide all the way up to about two inches wide and i make them in different variants things for getting in different areas for stock work you'll find that as a, as a great great tool other thing you'll need some, some steel wool and and also a good you know uh, stain remover because we're going to go into stocks and um, with stock work you really it's really not that difficult so kip how do you do a stock work well i could be here for quite a while i'll tell you how <laughs> But I can run it down within five minutes. Okay. And I'm, and I'm let, me, let me pause you for just a second. Couple sure. of things um, just before we move on. Can you show the magnifier headset again? Yes. And what would they look for if they're going to, I feel like we're taking a lot of notes here, you know. Um, mm -hmm. What would they look for if they wanted to Google that? 
magnifier uh, headset? Yeah, just look under other magnifying okay. uh, headsets, clamp stickers. You can buy these in just about any hobby store in America. People use them for uh, stamp collecting, mm -hmm. electronics. If you work on keyboards or, or um, I should say circuit boards, these are like you'll find these just about anywhere. You could just put on your magnification visor. Okay. And it comes, and one thing I'll show you, it comes in different powers. You have an eye here for mm -hmm. getting up close. You have one set lens that I use a lot for when I'm working on guns, especially as you get older, you find your eyes need it. Mm -hmm. Then you have another flip down one on the inside here, yep. right in yep. there, that also double magnifies it up. These are just an awesome tool to have. They run you about, they're all different prices if you shop on Amazon and well, eBay. I've seen them anywhere from 15 bucks up to about 40 bucks. Okay. I think um, I paid, I think I paid 15 for these. Nice. And, and that, that's great. I think there's a ton of chat chatter right now going on. So, um, couple notes there. A couple people are having a hard time seeing Kip and I'm not sure I haven't had any issues on my end. I'm wondering if maybe, um, if each of you could check and make sure that you're on the, the right view. Like maybe there's a weird, if you're on a phone, it's, everybody's going to have a different experience. You could be on a phone, you could be on a computer, on a laptop, on an iPad kind of deal. Everything might be a little bit different, but within Zoom, there are different views. I would suggest checking that first, making sure that you're either on speaker view or gallery view in case that helps at all. Um, could be a million things, could just be an internet connection. So there was somebody that asked if this is being recorded. It is, but don't kill me. I started it a little bit late. Ugh, sorry. Um, but the rest of it is being recorded. So we'll have all the rest of it um, if you want to ping back as well. However, don't leave yet. I'm giving stuff away on tonight's webinar only for the people who are live towards the end. So um, if you want swag or a chance to win swag, Stick around, you won't want to miss this topic anyway. So um, other than that, I think we're good. So we've got endo snake, we've got um, magnifying visor, mm -hmm. we've got, oh, um, the, and, and the blue book, there was a question about the blue book. Is that the type of thing you buy every time a new one comes out? You know, yeah. I think one guy was like, I have like the 40th edition and the 41st is out right now. You know, how does that work? I typically buy them about every three years. Okay. Um, you know, because any of you who've bought these books, they rarely change a whole lot year to year. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they've added a new manufacturer, but chances are with a lot of new manufacturers in that next three years, they, they may be out of business. So, you know, it's, it's, that's how a lot of this goes, but these are great books and I know they're not cheap. That's why a lot of guys don't want to buy them every year. And I understand that they're not, they don't give them away. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but they are such a good book. That's why they are what they are, why they cost what they cost. Yep. I don't know many gunsmiths that are on my level that do not use this book right here. Okay. Okay. Um, it's just, it's just full of that much knowledge guys. And it's really worth your, your, your money, your practice and it's tax deductible. Remember Thanks. anything you buy for your gunsmithing <laughs> trade is tax deductible. So get your CPA right. and take them all your little receipts because it does help you out. Yep. Um, but going back to the stock thing, I told you how to make your blocks. They're great for getting in different areas. Uh, one question I get a lot is checkering. Mm -hmm. How do you strip the stock and how do you protect the checkering? It's really quite simple. You need, I prefer to use, if I'm going to use a stripper, I prefer to use a gel. Okay. Your choice, whatever brand you like. I know there's some that, that are not real heavy chemically induced or more citrus induced. I do use those, they work right well. You don't need to leave it on there for 24 hours. Like some, I've read on, seen on YouTube and seen other places, that's just the fallacy. I'll show you how I do it. If I was going to do this one here, this one doesn't have a lot of checkering, but it's got the stripping and the squirrel on it. Okay, I gotta get all this back to virgin wood. And the reason I got to do that, because if I don't get this out of here, it's going to be very dark when I put the stain on there. It's going to give me dark spots. I don't want that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start small, like say from here to here. And I'm going to take my gel. And of course, you're going to make sure everything is off the stock. Any plastic pieces, any metal pieces, anything, there's nothing in the stock but wood. You're going to put that on there very liberally. Put it on one coat on, put another right on there with it, and leave it for just a few seconds. Take you a knife and just lightly let it scrape over the wood here. Just so I'm going to use my finger for a knife. Just lightly scrape over the, the stock right here. And look at it. Is, uh, is it all coming off or is it still coming on there? It only takes usually a few minutes for it really to come loose and come off. 
-hmm. Now, some may be stubborn and others where you have to leave it on a little longer. But you'll find it doesn't take much. So I'll take that off there. Okay, once I see it's ready to go, okay, then I go ahead and take my rags and I get it wiped off and I get all that stain off there, scrape it, whatever I need to do. Uh, a plastic body filler scraper is great. You don't have to worry about damaging the wood if you're scared about a knife doing that, which really it won't if you're very light. Mm -hmm. But you can use a body, good stiff body scraper, take it all off there, get her wiped down, take a look at it, and see if it's where you like it. If you got it down to the bare wood, okay, great. Now go up here to your what your checking area would be. Okay, you look at it, you look, see, okay, take that same scraper or that or that knife and just lightly go over the top. You're not gouging, you're not pushing in, you're just lightly going over. And if it comes off, you're golden. You're ready to take that stain out of there. And then get you a soft brass brush. We've all seen them in the gun cleaning kits that come with three brushes. Use a little brass one and go in there and follow the lines. Rake it back and forth, follow your lines this way, follow your lines that way. You'll get all that out of there once you wipe it down and once you realize that you know that you've got it out of there. This whole piece you do here, take your acetone on a rag and wipe it thoroughly. Get it, I mean, really work it good, wipe it thoroughly. You're not going to saturate it, but you're going to do it to get all that mm -hmm. stripper off there. And just continue that process through the rest of the gun. And get it all off. And get it off on the inside of the channel, the barrel channel here. If, it's, if it has it too, get it out of there too because we want to reseal all that wood. Mm -hmm. So when we get to the fore end, and this has it here, but if we had checkering down here, one thing we don't want to do is destroy the lines. So how do we do that? That goes back to those little wooden blocks I had you make. Mm -hmm. Now you can make those out of wood. or I prefer to the wood. I like to keep it straight. And I'll take it and you want to go long strokes one way. Go this way just like I'm doing here. Look at it and see. And as long as you're down to the line where the checker gets, you're golden. If you see you're going over that line a bit, adjust it to where you're not doing that. If you have to cut you another little piece of wood, whatever you have to do, just do that. And get that and do it the same way. Wipe it down. And once you have all the stock done and you've acetoned it down, it's clean, then you're going to want to run out, let it go. You got it all cleaned off there. Now we have to look at all the dents and scrapes and things like that. Sure. Now, how do you get those out? Two ways I do it. I steam the small stuff out. Okay, and then I epoxy the big ones out. Let how do you how do you steam the small stuff out? Can you walk That's through that process? Right now. Cool. If you do come to SDI, we do cover and show you how to do this, mm -hmm. the steaming part of this. But what you do is you basically take a dish towel, mm -hmm. soak it in some water, wring it out lightly, okay, and lay it up over there where that den is, like this. Go borrow your wife's iron and don't tell her. <laughs> she has a steam iron and, mm -hmm. and put that on there, put on steam mode. And what you'll do when you put that on there, now you're not going to leave it on there for 10 hours or two hours or even 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. You're going to get it good and warm and take it off. And you'll see that these little scrapes and these little tiny dents, that wood swells and it swells them and brings it back out. Once you're there, leave it alone. You're done. So then we go to the next step. I've got a dent that's too deep, and on this one I really don't have any here. But on um, one, let's say I've got a, a pretty good sized dent down here in the stock. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you one of my tips that works golden. Old timers like me know this. Some share, <laughs> some don't. Uh huh. What you would do is go down and get you some two-hour, two-part epoxy. JB Weld. Everybody makes it. You can buy it at Harbor Freight anywhere. I don't recommend five minutes because it sets up so fast. By the time you get start putting it in your hole and you get everything done, it's already cured. You don't want that. So put the two hour on there. And let's say I've got two or three little spots right here. I put it in there. I dab it in there. And I leave it to where it's just a little overflow on each one. Then I come in there and I take rip off pieces of masking tape. Mm -hmm. And then on that masking tape, and I'm going to use just a clear piece of tape to kind of show you what I'm doing here. Kind of hard to do it with the masking, but if I had that dent right there and I've got that epoxy in there, I'm going to lay this like this and I'm just going to let it fall down and just slightly put it on like so. Just leaving it loose and leave it like that. And you see, 
how it makes like a little pocket there. Well, that's exactly what it's going to do with that epoxy. It's not going to let it go any further. It's not going to let it scraper, and you got it flat pretty much, but with a little raise. Mm -hmm. Then once it dries, and you know it's dry, and how you tell it's dry, leave your little toothpick or whatever in the epoxy, and when it breaks the toothpick off, you know it's good. Come back and just take that tape off there, and you're going to have a little flat spot. Then the next step is, and you want to always have one of these available, is a six inch uh, normal file or universal file. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have to be anything special. And then what I do, I like to put it in either, a, I use a, I have a wood table, so I'll a lot of times just put it in a wood vise, but you can use your regular vise too with some soft jaws or wrap it up in some, some uh, towel, something you want to protect it, you don't need it very tight. Mm -hmm. So it's sitting basically at an angle like this, if this was the bench, so it's good and tight. Then I come across and I make sure I keep it perfectly flat. I don't lean it to the side, I don't lean it forward, lean it backward, just perfectly soft, and I just file that. And I keep doing that to the epoxy until I'm down to the wood. And you'll know. Trust me, you'll know when you see it. Mm -hmm. You stop right there. And you go do the same thing with the other ones. Okay? Now we're ready for the sanding process. But we're not quite there yet. So we've got that all done. And we say, okay, it's beautiful. I've got a stock strip. I've got all my, fill, everything's filled in. What's the next thing I'm doing? Well, I'm ready to get at it. Okay, well, you're not quite. Now you're going to take another rag, such as a small rag like this, with some water. What we want to do is we want to raise the grain of the wood. We want to bring back that virgin wood. So when we sand down, it really just really makes it nice. So you're going to do that lightly on the gun. You're just going to wipe the gun down with some water all over. To, you'll, you'll see it's wet, but it's not too wet. That's what you want. Mm -hmm. And just do it and then let it dry. Now when you feel it, you're going to feel it's a little bit in there. Perfect. Now we're ready to sand. So we sand it all down. And man, we've got it looking good. It is, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. We're ready to stain it. No, we're not. Now we're going to do it again. And we're going to just do that same thing, that little water trick there. There you go. What if the water, the water um, conditions the wood kind of, you know, gets it? Well, what, it, what it's basically doing is, is all the little burrs, the little things mm -hmm. that stick up, when you put that stain on there, you don't want that to happen. Right. So as much as that we can get off there, the better it is. So we just lightly sand that off. Now you can use steel wool to do this too. Mm -hmm. Steel wool works great for this. And also when you're stripping this gun, going back to that, because one thing I did want to make is steel wool is awesome for taking that stuff off there. And of course, keep a box by you because you want to throw all this junk in the garbage. You don't want to yeah. mess with strippers and all that. And once you've done it a little bit, throw it away, get another piece. Steel wool's cheap. And that will help you with the stripping, but it'll also help you with this. So you just do that very lightly. Now you feel it, it's smooth. Now we're ready to stain. And stain before it. you stain, what grit do you usually like for that kind of thing? Um, if, if the stop, by the time I'm getting there, I'm using like a 220. Okay. Somewhere in there. You don't need to you have it too fine and you don't need it real coarse because mm -hmm. you, you don't mm -hmm. just, even, even when I have the epoxy on there, I rarely use a really cool sand paper. Uh, you shouldn't have to. Okay. Because okay? we're just, like I said, we're just wanting to get the virgin wood. And when we get to the, the check ring, this is the other tip, just lightly sand over the top, keeping it flat. But don't sand sand. When I say sand, I mean you just go zip and zip and leave it alone. Because we don't want to flatten the crowns of, of the uh, where you've checkered. You know, you don't want to be taking those down too much. But you don't want them to or they swole up and you can feel it. You don't want that feel. Any mm -hmm. of you ever bought a cheap gun, you know exactly what I'm talking about when you grip it and you can feel the little burrs and things. That's exactly what we're talking about. So we've got her stain, okay? You feel that stain, you like it. You may want to just give her a light sanding until you get that color where you want it. Mm -hmm. Now, once we get there, you've got that thing completely stained. Now it's time for you to seal it what you're going to seal it with. That's a choice that you're going to have to make. I use a lot of true oil, and I use a lot of a, um, uh, I hate to hate to give names, but good old brown L spray tan lacquer. Sure. You guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Works wonderful and makes a very pretty, pretty sheen. And you can get it in matte, you can get it in gloss, you can get it in semi-gloss. Works really well. Once I have that coated, and I have this gun looking where I want it, okay, now I take it. And I go at it with some four-aught steel wool. 
after that lacquer is on there. And I just lightly go over the whole gun. Those of you who have ever done word working, you know where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. And then once I get it all smoothed down with acetone or, you know, if you feel like you can use a tack cloth, tack cloth is acceptable. Get all that off there. Now I'm going to coat it again. And I'm going to coat it. I'm going to do that process till I get to the level that I want the sheen or the finish to be at. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're doing like a high gloss, a higher end rifle, you can absolutely get that. So once we've done all that, and we've, we've done that steel wool the last time, and it's smooth, and it's, it's right where we want it, what do we do then? Well, then next we wax it. And you get your, your, your Karuba wax is, is the most common thing. Karuba wax is used in everything from auto wax to all kinds. I prefer okay. to get the Karuba men wax. Works really well. And really hand buff that thing out and do it more than once. Mm -hmm. And guys, when you get done with that stock, you are going to have one beautiful stock. And your customer is going to be very, very pleased. Um, I have a follow-up question for you. Mm -hmm. A couple people in the chat asked about the epoxy. So if you're if you're using that epoxy, how do you get it to match the color of the rest of the wooden stain? You don't have to. You just leave it clear. It's going to cover up the epoxy. One of the little tricks that we found many years ago that we liked is the stain goes right over it and colors it, and it don't have any problem. You'll never even see it. You'll no problems. It. You know. So um, just to make sure that we have that. Um, you're going with a clear epoxy, and mm -hmm. if you go with the clear route, then the stain should do exactly the same thing to the epoxy as it does to the wood. It will. Okay. And the reason it will do that is because you sanded that thing down smooth, okay? Mm -hmm. But when you sanded it smooth, you've created all the little valleys and crevices in it as well. You've roughed it up. So it literally, the stain sticks to it and seeps into it and fills nice. it. And it does, and it makes it nice and colorful, and you'll never see it. I've done oh. it, guys, I've done it hundreds and hundreds of times. Nice. Never, never been a problem. Um, and what was the wax you were talking about? Uh, it's a Kruba wax. Uh, Men Wax sells one, uh, along with all their stains and products made just for doing this and woodworking. You just get your woodworking wax, and it comes in a big thing. It's about eight bucks, and you'll, it lasts a long, long, long time, unless cool. you're doing a lot of restorations. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then you just buff it out. And I and, and a lot of people say, do you buff it out with a wheel? You can, but I, I use most of it by hand. I do most of it all by hand work. One, because I like to, and two, sometimes with a buffing wheel, people get a little carried away and you get burned. And sure. that's 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 dealing with a different problem. You don't really want that. Now, if you're very good with a buff wheel and you know what you're doing, yeah, just but do it with a very soft and do it with a very light touch. Just enough to buff it out and get that wax off there, and you'll be fine. Awesome. Yep. So that's pretty much it. Now, I took a little more than five minutes on that, but that's okay. But that, will, that will do that. Now, let's talk about metal. Okay, hold on. Before we go to metal, I had this question too. So, Casey, I'm glad you asked this, uh, or Albert rather. Um, how long does that process typically take if we're talking about just the woodworking to that <laughs> restoration? It's going to take you a few hours. Mm -hmm. if you're, you know, that's, that's why, uh, probably going back, I probably should touch on this. Gunsmithing, the reason you've never seen jobber books or anything like that is because it's very hard to judge. You have to judge the area you live in on what you're going to charge. Um, it's like I told our own, uh, one, one of the guys that worked for us a long time ago when he decided he was going to charge. Uh, you need to look at the area you live in, and you need to have your prices according to what they can afford. I know that can be disappointing to some people. As, it's uh, market value, though, you know. It is. It is it what it is. is. It is. If, you're, if the people in your area can only afford 35 an hour, you charge 35 an hour. Mm -hmm. A good way to judge a lot of that is to look at your shops in the area, mechanical shops and things like that. We're no different than mechanics, okay? And... And we all know that dealerships don't look at the dealerships because we all know that, that they don't care. They just charge whatever. <laughs> right. uh, they, they get the premium price. But most of your, your independent shops are you're pretty much in line with the area. They know what the people in the area can afford based on what they make. Mm -hmm. um, you can also get those demographics on any government site that we're in, and where you live in the city you live. They usually have a demographic section there that tells you what the average person makes and what the medium household is. That's, that kind of helps you make those decisions. So don't outprice yourself, but don't give yourself away. 
you've got to get paid for this because there is a lot of work to this. Yeah. That's why that's why restorations aren't done a lot. Now I know some gunsmiths that I've known for quite a years. Um, that's they got about 10, 20 years inside they want to slow down and they just stop doing everything but restorations. Mm -hmm. And that's all they do. And um, they've done pretty well with it. That you can because once you once you're known and on a certain level of restoration, trust me, guys, the customers are going to come, and they're not going to just come from your area. The, the, once the word gets out around, you you have them coming from all over the place. Mm -hmm. Okay, because there's there's not a lot of real talented gunsmiths out there. I hate to say so, but it's, it's an art, and it's something it's you have the, to work at forever to be good at it. You know exactly, and that's why at SDI we're striving to produce that type of guns and mm -hmm. give them that kind of knowledge so they can go out and be successful that way. Yep. Um, but going back to that, you know, I can actually do a stock with it. If, if I have no interruptions and no one to bother me, um, I like to let the drying times on the lacquers and stuff go for 24 hours. So you really can't count that time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I could probably do one in about five or six hours labor time. Now, keep in mind, labor time is different than five hours on the watch, you know. Sure. So... You, you have your different stages there. But the one thing I will tell you is don't rush. Don't rush. If it takes you 10 hours, then do 10 hours. Right. Okay. Because it, this is not a race, folks. In fact, most of your really good gunsmiths and most of the gunsmiths that are up on my levels and, and stuff, they do not take their time. That's why when you call them, they say, I got an eight-month backlog. Sure. Okay. Because they're not going to rush through anything. They're going to make sure that that gun leaves in pristine shape every time because that's what keeps the people calling saying, I don't care. I don't care. It takes a year. Right. Okay. And you really do have clients like that. Sure. Um, one case like that, uh, since we're talking about stocks, is this one right here. This is an old 1933 single shot H&R, probably worth about $110 in great shape or good shape. This was in not bad shape, but it's got some rough little dings and things on it. I had to replace the spring in it for him. But if you look, the stock don't quite fit the same. And the reason being is because this is the wrong stock for this gun. This particular client brought this gun to me six months ago. Why? Because his father gave him this exact gun when he was a little boy. And he's 70 something years old and he wants to shoot one like it one more time. Mm -hmm. That's his whole thing. He told me, I don't care what it costs. I don't care what it is. I've been searching to get the exact stock for this gun, which is very hard to find and very difficult. When you do, they want too much money. So at the end result of what we did, I repaired this one and I'm going to custom fit this one so I can, he can at least shoot the gun so I can find his stock because I may not be able to get one. And I have a lot of resources and my resources just say, I ain't got it. But if you look at this stock, let me get this light out of here. If you look at this stock, up around here, you can't tell that anything's ever been wrong with it. But what you don't know is this whole corner piece right here was gone. I rebuilt that with epoxy. Oh, neat. And then I stained it, and then I did some little tricks to it to make it match, and that's what we did. So when I get done reshaping this, he'll have a suitable gun that will still have it. The stops. actually a pretty good state to come off an old Stevens. But this is an example of a man that says, I don't care, I just want it because it's an heirloom. Right. So you're gonna get these guys, you're gonna get these, and besides the guns that actually in, Functional wise, it's in great shape and the board is really, really good. So there's nothing wrong with doing that for him. This particular gun, though, because of the man's age, and I'm uh, pretty sympathetic to people who are sick, uh, this man suffers from Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So he's not paying a penny to have this gun restored. Nice. I will not. Take That'll mean a lot to him. Yeah, I won't do that. And it's just like the pictures, Jennifer, that I sent um, when we were going to do the seminar. Yeah. The old Colt that you see, it's rough. And then that was the same way. That was a deputy who carried that as his sidearm for 30 plus years and he mm -hmm. had cancer. I didn't charge a penny for that. And that was, and he wanted something that's very hard to do. And any of you who know about guns, the original blue, dark royal blue that Colt used to put on guns years ago that you can't get no more. Well, that sure looks like it, don't it? Well, I figured out a way and a formula to do that. Cool. And I did not use hot caustic blue. I used a formula and a little technique with some cold blue. That's going to be for our SDI students very soon. 
Nice. And they're going to know how to, they're going to know how to do that. So if you want to learn that little trick, <laughs> come to SDI, you know, and that's just one example. Um, we restore lots of different things for lots of different, as I said, mm -hmm. um, it was there anything else about the stock they wanted? I think to that's it. And I know, and I know people are going to want to get to barrel work. So let's go ahead and right, um, pivot and I'll keep an eye on chat for anything else. So. Okay. Going to barrel work, barrel work's actually kind of easier. You've got a few choices, okay? Now, there are several ways to, let's talk about pitting. Pitting is the most common thing you see. Pits are usually not real deep, and if they're not, it's a real simple way to do it. You get yourself a good bastard file, no, I'm not cussing, and you put it in your vise, and you do long strokes down the barrel, all the way around the barrel, until you remove those pits. That's it. And then you're going to take that thing, over to your buffing wheels and you're going to go to Brownells because that's the only ones I know that sell it and get your buffing wheel compounds. Now, this is where you've had to have your discussion with your client. Does he want a real shiny barrel? Does he want a, you know, not so shiny barrel? That's all determined by polishing it out mm -hmm. and how it's going to look because hot caustic is hot caustic no matter what you put in it. And what makes it either a real shiny, smooth looking barrel is, is if you have a real high finish on it, and that costs more money. You're gonna charge accordingly to that. But if you're just doing a basic bluing to make it look factory new, you're gonna do about a number two or number three polish and that's it. And, and once that's done, you're gonna clean that barrel off completely in receiver, and then you're gonna dip it. You're gonna put it in your hydrovic dip after you've cleaned it properly and degreased mm -hmm. it properly. And then you're going to go ahead and, and hot caustic and do the hot costing process. But what do you do if you got a gun that the guy can't afford it? What, what can you do for him? Well, there's cold blowing. You can do forms of that. Like I said, I have a process that does not come off. It stays on for quite a few years. Uh, that little pistol we're talking about, the man's still with us. Thank God he still has it. I got to see it two weeks ago, and I haven't seen it in five or six years, and it still looks like the day I took it to him. And he shoots the gun. So it's not dissolving or anything of that nature. So you have that option. Then you also have the option of Cerakote and Duracote. Duracote, as you know, makes a bluing Duracote now that looks very similar to do. These are cheaper alternatives for your customer to be able to do. But there again, you still have to do all the prep work. Okay, you're gonna wanna do the prep work to do things right. Um, if you got dented barrels and things like that, you're going to have to go into a different process and probably too much to go into for tonight because I know we're getting down here in the nitty gritty. Sure, sure. But this is just a basic oversight. But like I said, look at the SDI in the future because we're going to have all this. Um, going that route, though, you have to make that determination with the client. Is it really worth them putting a ton of money in there? And of course, the third part, as I mentioned, the internals, parts. Sometimes you can get them, sometimes you can't get them, sometimes they're cheap, sometimes they're not. Mm -hmm. You need to do an all, what I like to do is do an all round estimate for the customer and give them choices in that estimate. Now, if you don't wanna pay this for the full package, I can do this or I can do this or I can do this. Your clients are going to love you if you do that because you're giving them a choice and you're being honest and you're not trying to screw them over because that's their biggest complaint in this industry. Even the ATF gets complaints about gunsmiths all the time about how they screwed them over on something they did. They can't get involved because they don't regulate that. Mm -hmm. Not yet, anyway. So with that kind of situation, always keep that in mind on the barrel side of work and stuff like that. But that is a very easy way to get those pits out. And what I like to do after I get those pits out is take my four-ounce steel wool, my oil, and go up and down the barrel and just clean it up good and on the receiver and you will be shocked at how well that works and then i degrease it and take it over to the polish polish her up and do whatever treatment i'm going to do to it and that's really basically it what buffer do you suggest for that um you know there's several buffers out there you can buy them or you can buy them from harbor freight you can buy them from northern tool you can buy them from grizzly you can buy them all the way up to, to snap on you know um, one good one, I, they're all really good. I've used them all and I've not had a problem with any of them, to be honest with you. Um, but you do want one that's powerful enough to do it. I would recommend a three quarter horse if you can get one. Okay. Um, the half, the half horsepower, they tend to bog down real easy and going to stop and slow on you. You don't want that. So I would, I would definitely look for a, like at least a three quarter horse to a one horse. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Good.
I have a ton of questions. Do you want me to get into those or do you have additional topics you want to do first? Uh, one thing I do want to show them, uh, like when you're dealing with a higher end pistol, mm -hmm. that's a Colt. Okay, now a Colt like this, before you tackle this, and this is what I want to tell you guys, make sure you know what you're doing. And this is only going to save you because when you're dealing with something like a Colt or a Model 29 Smith & Wesson, or one of the rarer guns out there that's bringing the big money, if you mess it up, I can almost pro promise you in this day and time, you're going to get a letter from his lawyer. And you're sure. either going to buy him another gun, a new gun, or you're not. But if it's a rarer gun, you're going to buy him another rarer gun in that condition. And that could set you back several thousands of dollars. Sure. Okay. I know somebody who ruined an original Colt Peacemaker one time from the 1800s, and it cost him right at $18,000 to replace it. From that hurt. That's no good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I think he's still crying about it, and I think he still hears about it from his Right, life. right. So, <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> so don't make that mistake. And also, I want to put out there, if you guys have any questions out there, kip, K-I-P dot carpenter at S-D-I dot E-D-U. I don't care who you are. We'll answer your questions the best, especially if you are an alumni or a student. Mm -hmm. I'm always there for my students and alumni. Like I said, I have several alumni that contact me on a regular basis and have shops open. Yep. And that's the other thing I want to say, too, is, is a lot of our graduates, they sure seem to be doing pretty well out there in yeah. their jobs after their education at SDI. Yeah, so I think that speaks for SDI. But we're here to help you. We're not going to be like the other people out there who just once they got your money and you're done, they forget about you, no matter what they tell you. We actually, we walk the walk that we yep. so Definitely. So you can always do that as well. So with that, let's dive into some questions while we have the time. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So, um, all right. When would you use slow rust bluing? Well, slow rust bluing is a choice you have to make. First of all, you want to make sure that, and I should have covered this a little earlier, you want to stay as close to the manufacturer specifications as you can to match mm -hmm. a restoration job to a manufacturer. If they slow rusted blue, you want to slow rust blue. If the customer asks you to slow rust blue, by all means do so if it'll take to that metal. That's where you're going to have to know some metallurgy and you're going to have to do a lot of studying. And you're going to mm -hmm. have to read some books because there's, there's some good ones out there and we cover the SCI as well. Um, certain Winchester 94 revolver or uh, rifles, okay, the gun that won the West, you know, good old fashioned lever action. Mm -hmm. If you put the receivers into a hot blue solution, you're going to wish to God and the barrel you never did. Ooh. It's going to come out looking purple. <laughs> oh, so, no. And you don't want that. So there are some things about different gun things. Obviously, an 870 in Remington, you're going to blue the barrel, but you're not going to blue the receiver because it's made of aluminum. So hot caustic is not good for these kinds of things. So you do have to know your metallurgy book, and there's several out there that are good. You know, stay away from YouTube, folks. I know YouTube's popular, but I cannot tell, I've told this time and time again to people, there's a lot of people who read about something, they take it to that, but they don't give you all the particulars, and then you end up messing your guns up, or you're messing somebody else's guns up. So if you're going to seek the advice of someone, even if it's not us, go to some gunsmith who's been practicing for at least 15, 20 years and ask him. Okay, and hopefully, and hopefully he, he likes you enough that he'll tell you sure. and not give you some BS information so he, you get the, he gets that client when you mess up that gun. Um, but go to someone you could really trust on that because mm -hmm. guys, you know, like I said, some of these people, they're going to be very upset if you mess up their heirloom. That's just the way it is. And, and like I said, this is a litigious society, so don't risk it. For sure. Um, th we had a couple questions that kind of go together about um, – are there any instances or how do you know whether restoring it is going to be positive or negative to the value of the gun kind of deal? Like, are there insta instances in which a restoration would devalue the gun, that kind of thing? Yes. Absolutely. When you have a gun, and I'm going to use this lever action again, there's no way I'm going to strip this gun to restore it. There's just no way. I may, I may do some little things to it to get rid of the pit or something else. But this has got a lot of natural patina. This is what collectors want in guns. They want this gun. They don't even care a lot of times about a lot of that because 
this is the gun that somebody held their hand back in the old days when Bill Hickok and all them arrived. And this, it may have shot a buffalo. It may have done. They don't want it messed with. Okay, and that's fine. So you have to determine whether or not this is a candidate for a full restoration or not. If it doesn't need to be, then it's not. Don't do it. If it needs a little cleaning up, that's fine. If it's got a little bit of too much pit, you can take that pit out without messing up that patina, that's okay. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times if you restore a gun, you're destroying the value of the gun. And that's where you need to do that. Now, a lot of these books will give you tips like the blue book and stuff. And also, I suggest that you also use another source uh, that's out there. They write a lot of books on collector guns and it's called the NRA. The reason I say that their museum and their museum curator, the curators are really good. And also they have a television show if you got cable and, and whatnot, watch their show because this is what they cover a lot. And a lot of times they'll explain the difference between what is a collector gun, what is not a collector gun, what is a high collector gun, what is a low collector gun. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody brought me a gun like this and it was thrashed and it was rusted over, and when I say rust over, you, a lot of you guys know exactly what I mean. It's not pitting, it's rust. Yeah. And the barrel, the bore's not real good in it and stuff like that. Then by all means, that's probably a candidate for you to go ahead and restore if you can. And you can do so. Um, a lot of questions also I get on restoration too on, on, the, on these older guns is should I lap the barrel? If the barrel is done, should I shouldn't send around? You can do that, but don't do a lot of it. Because every time you send a bullet down, with lapping compound on it, you're lowering the <laughs> the lands of grooves. And the last thing you want is that bullet to get too loose in there because believe it or not, even fractions of inches, that bullet will tumble, it will start moving side by side when it comes up the board. Not only is it not going to be accurate, but it's probably going to tumble on you anyway. Sure. So the kind of go to the old physician's code, do no harm. Right. Absolutely. A um, couple questions on pitting. Uh, and I think I know that, that there's a big difference between a little bit of pitting and a lot of bit of pitting, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But a couple people have asked, what do you do if you discover some minor pitting on the inside of a barrel? A couple have asked, what if I've got like a bunch of pitting on the lower? Do you want to talk through that topic a little bit? Sure. You start out with your steel wool and your oil. Four-aught steel wool and a good gun oil. Okay. Mm -hmm. CLPs, the modern Spartan, any of those that are really good oil. Um, because one thing, and, and I'm not going to just produce it, but the, a lot of those oils have a rust inhibitor in them anyway. Okay, and they have some Teflon in it, which means it's a smoother oil. So when you take that smooth steel wool and that oil, you're just stroking it or going back and forth, stop and wipe it and look at it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think you can see it good, then take some acetone and get it off there and look at it then. You only want to get those pits smooth enough. Now, if it's a, it's a gun that's not worth a lot of money, then by all means, there's other things. You can take a file to it and get the pitting out and then re-blue it over if you want to. Or if, mm -hmm. they just, if they just want that smoother look, you can. This older gun that I have with a natural patina, it has little fine pitting in it, but it's, I've stopped it. How I stopped it was with the steel wool lightly and the gun oil that has the inhibitors in it, and I'm leaving it just like that. If I did more than that, I'd take that good old plum blue up there, and I do not want to do that because I'll destroy the value of the gun. Um, those are those are those decisions you're going to have to make. And sure. if you don't know the answers, you need to seek the advice of someone who does, because like mm -hmm. I said, it can make a difference. Even if it's your own gun, even it makes a difference of what the value of that gun's going to be. Yep. And what steel wool do you recommend in these instances? Uh, Walmart brand four aught. Yep. Okay. Four aught. Four zeros, just four like zero, 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 right. That's right. It's just like buckshot. You got one aught, two aught, three aught, four aught. Use yep. that four aught, you know. Exactly. Um, and it works very well. Don't overdo it. And like I said, always go a little bit and stop. You you don't want to remove things unless you have to. And how about pitting inside the barrel? Pitting inside the barrel is a whole different beast. There's a couple of ways I've done it. If it's a light pitting or a light rust, I have been known to take an old fashioned aluminum cleaning rod and with a nice soft brass brush or copper brush like you get in your cleaning kit coat that thing full of oil run it down there and clean it out you that's acceptable but i've had a lot of years experience so i kind of know the feel of what i'm doing and, and keeping it straight that is the thing you're not really going to mess it up 
because you're not going to do that much. You're only going to turn a little bit, but you're going to have to work the entire barrel. Mm -hmm. Don't just do it in one spot because that's no good. Go down the entire barrel, come back with it, with its main, take it out. Uh, one way you can do it is to take your stand-up drill press, okay, and then go from the bottom up and just take it down one time and I stop and then I clean it out and run it. Now, another way you could do that is to run some rounds through it. A lot of times rounds will help take that, but if it's a little bit of pitting, like you said, that's on server truck, but if it's a little pitting, what you can do, you can use a little lap, okay? But I don't suggest using a lot of it. More than likely, if it's a, if it's a surface type pit, you're gonna get it out with that brush pretty good. And then if you run a couple of bullets down there, usually that'll help, you know, finish any other thing out, take it out with it. If that does not work for you, then you go to the lap and try to try to shoot some hot laps down it. And for those that don't know what that is, again, that's a bullet that has lapping compound. You can buy them or you can even do your own, a lot of guys do. But remember, we don't want to start removing a lot of metal because if you do that, you're going to loosen that bore up and you're going to be, that's going to make it even worse. You don't right. want to do that. So, okay. you know, and, and uh, those of you who are familiar with laps know that that's a lot of times that when a barrel is too tight, that's what they'll do to loosen it up a little bit. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's great. one way you can do that. Other way is to is is um, if you're going to reblue the whole gun anyway, okay, you can just go in there with your brushes and really get it out good and remove your bluing and everything else and get it out. Um, that's about your only choices other than, other than replacing barrels. Okay, okay. Um, I still have a ton of questions, but I know we're past time, so let me just pick a couple of these. And guys, if I didn't get to them, I really apologize. Thank you so much for being so engaged oh, tonight. It's need part two. <laughs> well, we'll need a part two for sure. So, um, okay, so way at the beginning, I think this is a, uh, there were a couple reference questions. So where does one find specifications for mechanical limits on, pers on particular parts? Any resources along that, those lines that you can recommend? I suggest going back and finding as many old gunsmith books as you can, especially okay. if you're dealing with guns that's been around a long time. Like you said, here's the problem, folks, with manufacturers. They don't like to tell you anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they don't make available their specs and things. Some will, but most do not. Remington, not going to tell you a thing. Smith & Wesson, not going to tell you anything. Over the years, I have been lucky enough to make a few friends that work for both companies that have shared some things with me sure and all that but you can find specs out there uh there's there used to be some really good old books out there you're going to have to probably search amazon for them because i know they're no longer in print and published because these mm -hmm. smiths are long gone and have passed away um there was one out there and i believe it was called engineering or firearms or something of that nature and in there he covered a lot of specs he was a, a mechanical engineer by trade who was also a gunsmith and of course, his gunsmithing was his part time thing. And he would do that. He would measure out and spec all parts when they were brand new when he bought them, and then he'd write them down in a notebook. And that's one way a tip for you guys that you can do that too. If you've got new guns in your shop and you know these are guns that are going to be coming into your shop, mm -hmm. you can take that gun apart and measure those, those uh, uh, parts precisely and write them down in a notebook. Yes, that's a lot of work. But you know what? That's what's going to make you different than the guy next to sure. you. So when you need to know that specification, it's there. Um, there may be, you may be able to get lucky enough to find a few books, but usually you don't find a lot of that out there. You have to do a lot of deep research, and you want to talk to a lot of people that you can get to know that's been doing this for a long time because a lot of times they take notes like this and we share. So, you know, if they like you, they will. If they don't like you, they won't. Right. <laughs> You know, that's kind of way, that's kind of what Groovington is, you know. And, guys? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it's like when I came here, just a, just a quick thing, you know, uh, when we were writing up on the Remington 700, Brian came and he says, Kip, I can't find anything. I'm troubleshooting on this thing anywhere. I said, that's because they won't give me what my notes. Yes. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> you know, so that's what we, I gave them a whole list of 14 things of troubleshooting. Yep. So these are the things that, that come with experience. We, we know sure. a lot of this. Um, the man who was really great, about not not being afraid to share his specs was John Browning. John Browning, I think, was just really proud of his his specs and stuff anyway. Sure. But but you, you could get a lot of stuff there. But but my, that's my suggestion. Go look for the older books. Don't yep. modern stuff. There is some, but it's probably going to be very vague. It's probably going to be referring to more modern guns like Glocks and things of that nature, mm -hmm, rather mm -hmm. than a lot of the old standbys like your A5 
brownings and things of that nature. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think I'm going to um, end it there. I think we're at a good natural, you know, end point for that. There will, we'll definitely bring Kit back for a part two at some point. Um, and just so you guys know, we are in the process right now of building out a really cool webinar calendar for the rest of the year with even more um, SDI faculty members. So be excited for that. Uh, I know I promised some giveaways, so we are going to do that right now before we leave. Um, let me think of how I want to do this. So you're going to enter in the chat section. Um, and what I'd like you to do is help me out and think of a webinar topic that you might be interested in. I will pick a couple people at random. Um, so go ahead and pop on over to the chat section. Let me know the types of stuff that you guys are into. I'm, um, you know, a big component of booking these events and kind of helping work through the topics and everything. So let me know your thoughts. Um, I'm going to give everybody about 30 more seconds to put their stuff in. Um, and then I'm just going to choose a couple people at random here. So jotting down names. How many do you think I should pick? I'm gonna go with four. I think I'm gonna pick okay, four. Cool. Four lucky people tonight are gonna to win some SDI swag. Um, nice. Okay. Keep going, keep going. I'm scrolling right now. And I while Jennifer my winners. Is, go ahead. Jennifer's picking names. I just want to say to everybody: if you are a potential student or if you have been a student, look to us here in the future. We have some really cool new programs coming out and some new stuff and i think you guys are really gonna i know we can't talk about it it's super it. secret but ooh, you guys there is some cool stuff going on um okay i've got two of them i'm gonna do oh i saw lonnie barrett's name hey lonnie how's it going um i think i have lonnie in one of my classes i think you probably did uh, okay, I think I've got them. I see a lot of things popping up down there in the chat. A lot of I know that's going to be super helpful. And I, folks, I can guys. tell you, I can tell you that some of those topics you never know what Santa Claus might bring. Oh, this interesting. Time. Okay, so. First of all, huge thank you, everyone. We have 205 attendees here till the nitty gritty. I really appreciate that. Hope you enjoyed tonight. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I know I said I would pick four, but I'm going to pick five. You guys know me. I like giving stuff away. So um, I've got five winners listed here. Um, if I say your name, here's what I need you to do. Jot this down. I need you to email marketing at sdi.edu. And I need you to email marketing at sdi.edu with the following topics or items. Um, I need your t-shirt size, phone number, and mailing address. I'll get your email when you email us, you know what I mean? So I won't need that one. So, uh, and give me your first and last name because sometimes it shows up funky on these things. So um, first and last name so I can keep it straight. T-shirt size, phone number, emailing address. You're going to email it to marketing at sdi.edu. Thank you, Scott, for putting it down there. Um, here are my five winners for tonight. Uh, first one, Justin Johnson. Justin Johnson, congratulations. Uh, second one, Joseph Dye, D-Y-E, Joseph Dye. Uh, third one, Daniel Cox, C-O-X, Daniel Cox. Fourth one, Channing Applegarth, A-P-P-L-E-G-A-R-T-H, I believe. I was jotting these really quickly. Uh, fifth one, Carl Crossman, C-R-O-S-S-M-A-N. Um, congrats, guys. Um, I didn't even look at the topics, you guys. Honestly, I was just scribbling stuff as you were putting them in. So uh, I, it wasn't based on the topics or anything totally, totally random. Um, congrats. Join us next time. I'm going to keep giving stuff away at these webinars. Uh, like I said, we're going to have um, different and, and more SDI faculty members in with different topics. So uh, thank you for helping us kind of dig into that a little bit with your interests. Uh, I have recorded this. Oh, I started recording it maybe 15 minutes late. So super sorry about that. Um, but if you do have any questions, let us know and we will get that on YouTube as soon as possible.
All right, guys, everybody have a great night. Huge thank you to Kip Carpenter. My buddy, Kip, you've done such a good job. Everyone has loved it. Well, Um, it's my pleasure. You know I love doing these things, and I love sharing my knowledge with the students because they are the future of gunsmithing. And I want to say one other thing real quick. Okay, do it. To any of you ladies out there who might be listening in, I'm a big advocate, and Jennifer will tell you I have been since I got here. I want to see more ladies in this business. I saw a couple. Oh, I saw really? a Veronica in here earlier. Please check us out at SDI because we would love to have you. And we've had some ladies, and we've had some that have gone on to do some really cool things in the That industry. is correct. And I'm telling you, there's a niche here for you. And you guys are planning on having a shop. Why not have a husband and wife team? Let her take the course too. We've yeah. got a husband and wife enrolling in the April class, actually. So awesome, that's, and we've got an April it. class that's starting this uh two two mondays from now i believe right um, so, it, so, so a lot of guys are very male dominated in their things we welcome you please come 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 we want you to come in here and learn too because like i said i love to see more women get into this program and for sure this business and ladies don't have bad habits so they're easier to train <laughs> that's true i i don't know kip you know me i've got some bad habits myself so ah no <laughs> when it comes to guns they listen and they just do it and it's that's how they, they're really good in fact if you want to guys want to hear a real quick little story about a true story about somebody you a lot of you guys know anyone heard of the ak-47 the show <laughs> yeah i'll get a glitch the cop i can say his name right right okay do you know that from the beginning in his plant, he hired nothing but women. There was only really? two guys that worked there. And the reason he did, the reason he did, he said they'll listen to exactly what he says and how yep. to build it, and they'll do a better job. And to this day, the majority that works in that factory are women. I love it. We need more women. I need more women in this industry, guys. Come keep me. So, Go. So yeah. So guys and gals and wives, you're like, come on, you know. Yeah, you know, send your kids. They're old enough. We're ready for them too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, Kip, I really appreciate it, awesome. um, guys. Thank you so much for being with here, being with us here tonight again. Uh, Justin, Joseph, Daniel, Channing, and Carl, email me uh, marketing at sdi.edu, and we will get you some fun stuff. And I hope everybody can um, be with us next month as well, which I believe is May fifth or seventh, whatever that Tuesday is. Um, I will keep everybody posted via email and social and you know we send all these out so uh we will hope to see you at the next one uh and kip again thank you so much everybody have a wonderful evening guys talk to you soon bye everybody bye-bye